So um, what is this afternoon about? Um, well, as you may be aware, in um, Glasgow at the moment, a lot of people um, are meeting to talk about very important things about the future of the planet. Um, and, and you may be optimistic or less so, um, but undeniably, science has really informed um, and has shaped this debate um, and highlighted the need for change. But in order for that change to happen, um, we really need to understand how society works and the value there of social science, and whether it's changing behaviours, jobs um, or implications for social justice. Um, there is a need now and there will be an increasing need for social science to inform and to be able to contribute. Um, this is a challenge for researchers, uh, particularly new researchers, in terms of trying to bridge that gap between research, which very often is very, very focused in detail on a specific, specific problem, trying to address and trying to communicate to questions and issues that are raised on a more broader level. Um, there is this gap in communicating research, and that is one of the things that's very important part of the PhD process and something that SGSS is very interested in supporting students being able to communicate their research to a wider audience. So for today, um, we um, selected some presentations that were um, that were chosen because not only of their relevance to the debate, but because they demonstrated this ability to, to, sh to highlight the importance of the work. And for those people on the call whose work is not about COVID, um, sorry, not about climate change, um, I, I, it's really good to sort of reflect on how much, how easy you find it to engage with the research, whether some of the messages have, have gone too much into detail and, and maybe reflect on your own work about how easy it is to communicate. Um, as well as the, the presenters um, who you can see um, on the mirror board and the posters as well, um, we are very lucky to have for experts um, join us who, who I hope will be able to comment and, and ask some questions of the presentations and debate. Um, we have Professor Deirdre Shaw, who is a Professor of Marketing and Consumer Research at the University of Glasgow. We have Professor Ian Doherty, who's Dean for the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of Stirling. Dr. Rahima White, who's a Senior Lecturer in Sustainable Development at the University of St Andrews. And Dr. Sam Shackley, who is a reader in Climate Change at University of Edinburgh. Um, enough of me. Um, I'd like now to hand over to, to Simon, given his expertise in the area, just to say a few words um, about the significance of PhD research for climate change before we get started with the presentations. Thank you, Andrew. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the intro and um, great to see so many people here really looking forward to this. Um, just in terms of who I am, I look after the MSc programmes in the School of Geoscience at the University of Edinburgh. So a bit, I, I reckon that we normally have about three to 400 students. So I reckon about at least half of those are primarily kind of climate change focused. Um, that's kind of increased over the years. Um, and I do my, I teach on an MSc called Carbon Management, which is kind of interdisciplinary, spanning natural science, social science. Um, my own research is in social science of climate mitigation and greenhouse gas abatement. Um, so I just wanted to make four points really in my, my short uh, section here. So the first one is what I've called unity of purpose. So as Andrew mentioned, the natural sciences have created the foundation upon which carbon budgets and much of our understanding of climate houses is based. And to date, it must be said, the social sciences, with the exception of economics, has played second or even third fiddle to the natural sciences. But in a way, that's not so surprising because we need the science to be firmed up to the point where dissent was unlikely um, based upon the science. So, you know, I do see natural science really as the glue that's held the climate change issue and community together so far. So that's what I mean by unity of purpose. So I don't really see the, there's any conflict there, different roles and histories, but now we've got this united purpose about net zero and addressing climate hazard, loss and damage, et cetera. My second point is really from targets and ambitions to implementation and action. We've heard a lot of this from COP already. So how we de decarbonize, adapt to climate change is where the debates now moved. So social science, and I'd like to add in humanities here because I think they're really important as well. Um, they include many specialities and collectively provide huge knowledge and expertise, which can help in making this transition happen. Now, the transition can be done well, but it could also be done in a chaotic way that's very damaging to many. And personally, I believe that social sciences and humanities here are not a luxury, but actually a key way in which the transition is going to be affected responsibly, 
fairly and effectively. My third point is what I've called united we fall, divided we stand. So we have a unity of purpose, but it doesn't mean say we're all going to agree on how or on our so how we achieve this transition or on our understanding of the implications and repercussions of different approaches. Personally, I think diversity is actually our strength here because it's a necessary in reflecting our inevitable differences. There is always a danger of authoritarianism in neglecting pluralism, or possibly that could be chaos could be emerge as well from neglecting pluralism. However, we as academics in social sciences are sometimes our own worst enemies by splintering into ever more specialized academic activities, whether that's focused on theory, methods, particular data analyses, particular publications. And we could end up just confusing those outside. And I'd say we, we probably confuse many on the inside as well. And this can lead to a lack of engagement with social science. And unfortunately, that can leave the field rather open to more what I'd call policy friendly experts who may, however, be peddling a rather too narrow view of what the challenges are and the repercussion in, in impacts of different approaches in decarbonizing and adapting. So I think we need to learn better how to put aside our own internal differences, if you like, despite the fact that there are very well articulated theoretical and methodological approaches that add to what is actually necessary pluralism. And we need to find better ways of communicating with one another to fight this fragmentation. And I'd like to suggest here that instrumentalism and rationality does not need to be pitted against approaches which start with very different premises in examining and then testing the appropriateness or unintended consequences of the socio-technical experimentation, which is going to be absolutely essential to achieving this transition in the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years. So the final point is what I've called becoming better at working with government, companies, other pe public sector organizations, local communities, and NGOs. Now, the IPC has really shown us the way that academia and research can work together to guide um, policy and politics through a very detailed interactive dialogue. Now, the wealth of knowledge and insights from the social sciences and humanities is insufficiently used by climate policymakers, not only in the UK. And collectively, we need to find a way of working to make it easier for insights to be used at a whole range of scales. And as an example, we have local, regional and national initiatives that are crying out for more research support, but our institutions are not always supportive of this. So those are the four points I want to start with. And I'm really interested to hear what everyone has to say and take part in discussion later. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sam. So um, we are now going to, to move to our speakers. So if you are on Miro, um, you will be able to see that the first speaker we have is Corinne Angier. Um, this girl, she's talking about global school mathematics and global citizenships only connect. Um, if you if you go onto um, the mirror board, you can if you click onto the presentation, you will see that it is possible to actually click through the slides. So if there's anything you 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 want to see in advance or you want to look back at what she's talked about, then the presentation's there. Um, are you ready, Corinne, to present? Okay. So good afternoon, and um, I'd like to start by thanking the SGSSS for this opportunity to talk about my research and for their support in preparing this presentation. My title is a response to a challenge to try to summarize my research in seven words. And I think this map is a nice example um, of the connection possibly between school mathematics and global citizenship. And we'll return to it at the end, but meanwhile, you might like to ponder um, what's going on here. Um, a slightly longer summary of my research might be that in Scotland, all teachers are asked to embed global citizenship into their practice. And is this realistic in secondary mathematics classrooms? There is scope in the curriculum, particularly through the applications of mathematics courses, and there is some policy encouragement in learning for sustainability. And my research is exploring how these affordances can be actualized. I've been collaborating with a third sector organization, SCOTDEC, a development education center, to devise professional learning material and classroom resources to support maths teachers. I'm interested in the wider policy environment, but I'm also interested in what and how we can learn from the maths teachers who choose to engage with this aspect of their professional practice. And this afternoon, I'm going to talk a little bit about that policy context and then about my work with Scott Deck. And I hope to show how this connects to day-to-day -day maths teaching. 
I should probably also add that I am quite old and I've spent many decades teaching maths in school classrooms and working with um, beginner teachers um, through a sort of plethora of um, initial teacher education routes. So why is it important to study this relationship? Um, well, it's difficult to see how we can even begin to discuss issues such as climate change, environmental destruction and sustainable living without using mathematical tools. And the curriculum for excellence in Scotland is intended to be holistic. And statements like the one above from a thematic mathematics inspection report appear to support teachers making connections to the real world. But I wonder what's meant exactly by value and credibility. Value to whom and how might we recognize, describe or even measure this value? Maths definitely has a day-to-day -day value in our lives, but maths qualifications have an exchange value that's very high. And teachers may find they have to choose between developing generic skills such as collaborative problem solving and critical thinking and focusing on preparing pupils for exams. In the senior phase especially, which some teachers have described as a box, um, it's almost impossible to do both. And even worse, Williams and Chowdhury argue that the use value of mathematical competence actually contradicts its exchange value. So that the kinds of classroom activities and pedagogic approaches that would support mathematical use value contradicts those that would support um, the exchange value. So you might think about, for example, a maths teacher taking a group of children outside with clinometers they've made to measure heights of trees, to then connect that both to trigonometry and to models for carbon capture, or a teacher encouraging their students to do lots more practice of typical exam questions in order to perform well in an exam hall. So one of the key themes of my research is the complex and conflicting possible purposes of maths lessons, which children spend a lot of their hours in. Credibility, I think, relates to the issues of active global citizenship and agency. And if pupils have no opportunity to connect their learning to their interests and what has been called by Gonzalez and Moll their funds of knowledge from their day-to-day um, -day lives, or worse, if only some pupils can make that connection because the mathematics classroom represents white middle-class life, then they won't have the confidence to use um, maths to make informed decisions. Um, or to challenge and question quantitative information that they're given. So in Scotland, the applications of mathematics offers an alternative qualification route, and it demonstrates exactly this tension. There's loads of potential for different approaches for teaching and the use of contexts that are valuable and credible to young people. But the qualification itself has a reduced exchange value, exchange value in the public eye. So having said a little bit about maths, I'm now going to say a little bit about global citizenship, which in the Scottish curriculum is a part of learning for sustainability, which was originally coined by the One Planet Schools Working Group to mean a whole school approach. And some of the themes that it's envisaged to encompass are shown here. It is now an entitlement for every child and addressing learning for sustainability is part of the professional standards for all teachers. So what might that mean if you're a secondary maths teacher? Is it something that happens out with your ordinary teaching practice in sort of interdisciplinary or extracurricular projects? Or is it something that happens in your day-to-day -day classroom work? Now, it's not unusual to find tensions and contradictions within any country's education policy. And the OECD said this year that continued efforts are needed to enhance the coherence of curriculum for excellence. But in Scotland, there's a kind of additional dynamic because education is a devolved area of policy making, making it very high profile for a government that's seeking independence. And Arnett and Osgur are amongst the many scholars who've analyzed the complex connections between nationalism and Scottish education policy. And learning for sustainability policy can likewise be read and appropriated in different ways. And you might notice there are subtle differences between these two word clouds, for example. Now I read three different and competing discourses in the learning for sustainability policy. There is a nationalistic rhetoric of an independent flourishing Scotland that makes very strong connections to place and outdoor learning. There's also the socially just and sustainable social democratic tradition that makes connections to collaborative learning and involving learners in decision-making. But there is also as well the boast of an advanced capitalist and globalized economy 
that makes connections to skills for work and improving attainment and achievement. And when these conflicting interpretations of policy reach the maths department, it's often skills for work and raising attainment in national qualifications that get prioritized, not least because these align with other policies, such as the National Improvement Framework, which are far more prominent in the monitoring and inspection of schools. Now, schools are used to being called to account by local authorities and by the inspectorate, but there's also a growing youth voice which is demanding to be taught the future. And these articulate young people have now experienced some agency in challenging the SQA grading system that followed the cancellation of exams. They are right now in the streets of Glasgow and indeed all over the world, challenging leaders, many of whom incidentally have excellent mathematics qualifications and yet are overseeing the ongoing destruction of the planet that these young people are going to be inheriting. As I mentioned before, the multiple and sometimes conflicting purpose of maths lessons is a key theme in my project. And Haruni, writing from the USA, claims it's impossible to connect education to action and purpose. And many would argue that education and schooling in particular is becoming standardized across the world with a focus on training, testing, ranking that is fueled by initiatives such as the OECD PISA test, which produce global league tables. It is not hard to make the case that there is a disconnect between current schooling and the needs of our planet. But I think and hope there might be a slightly different and potentially very positive story to tell from the Scottish context, where education is intended to equip young people to be effective contributors and responsible citizens. And as you can see, there is currently no research as yet. So I am incredibly fortunate to be the recipient of an innovative collaborative research scholarship. Um, and my collaborative sponsor is ScotDEC, um, one of the five development education centres in Scotland, which cover between them all of the 32 local education authorities. ScotDEC's number four on the map. And I want to suggest that this model for a PhD is incredibly valuable because it challenges the boundaries between theory and practice. I'm not going to talk today about some of the problems that this causes and the ethical risks in get involved, but I want to stress the huge positive benefit of simultaneously doing and thinking about doing. I will be drawing on Hannah Rent in my thesis as someone who was caught between the intellectual interest of philosophy and the urgent demands of policy and of politics in her time. I feel hugely privileged to be able to move sideways between scholarly activity and practical activity, albeit like a slightly frazzled crab at times. So I've been working alongside Scott Deck for three years now to develop professional learning materials for maths teachers and classroom resources. Now, typically secondary maths teachers have not tended to choose to engage with the professional learning offered. And three years ago, at the start of a European Union Global Issues Global Subjects project, we struggled a little bit to get maths teachers involved. I don't think it's because they think these issues are any less important than any other teacher does, but they struggle to see how they fit within their classroom, particularly when they're under pressure to prepare pupils for exams. Now, last month, Scott Deck began a new six month project following a successful bid to the Scottish Government STEM Professional Learning Fund. And we've recruited 20 maths teachers from nine schools in three local authorities within Forth Valley and West Lothian Regional Improvement Collaborative. And we're very much hoping this project will get a further year's extension in March. The new project is not directly a part of my research, but it might be argued that without my collaborative scholarship, it would never have happened. And one of the questions I've been talking to teachers about is how or what do you think maths lessons contributed to the education that pupils need in order to cope with things like the COVID pandemic? Great question, and I think disappointingly little. Oh, I don't think maths lessons per se contributed. There was too much stress and confusion about SQA qualifications, too much focus on what to learn for the exams for any of this to be joined up thinking. So is it really possible that maths lessons can be so cut off from our day-to-day -day experiences even when those experiences include a great many mathematical concepts. The pandemic has demonstrated that maths is a powerful and very important tool to measure and model our world. And we need our young people to develop critical math skills so they can ask questions and notice when information is being misrepresented. And there is a great deal of scope, oops, sorry, in statistics for this. Um, 
But stats is poorly represented in the Scottish um, maths curriculum and not at all at higher. So we also need our young people to develop confidence and what's been called quantitative literacy. They need to be able to work collaboratively and most importantly, they need to appreciate different perspectives, which is not often a characteristic of maths classrooms. So while statistics might seem the most obvious way to connect maths and global citizenship, it's also about having a strong sense of number and probability, being able to estimate and work with new and unfamiliar measures such as carbon dioxide equivalent. So much of this connects to the day-to-day -day curriculum, which all Scottish pupils will be studying. So the question then becomes, how is maths being taught? Since the pandemic, I've actually used quite a lot of examples across all my year groups about epidemics modeling, rates of infection, percentages, proportion. I don't remember having used those examples in the past. I'm aiming for them to understand how useful maths can be to deal with problems like this that affect our lives so much at the moment. So this maths teacher clearly sees that they have a purpose beyond their pupils achieving qualifications. And it's led to a shift in the examples they've chosen for their classroom. Now the choice of examples is very important and teachers are quite naturally influenced by those that appear on SQA papers, like this one about Erin's yacht. Now, this question might be used, as Marilyn Frankenstein suggests, indeed if I was teaching it with it, I would, to open up discussion about salaries. How much do you need to be earning to buy a yacht for £780,000? It might also be used to discuss women CEOs or even the polluting impact of yachts in the ocean. It may even seem quite funny if there happens to be an errand in the class. But I worry that after a while, seeing questions like this all the time starts to suggest that maths is to do solely with consumerism and capitalism. The lovely graphic in the corner was recently devised by the SQA to help publicise their response to the Scottish Government's action plan to try and better embed learning for sustainability across the sector. And the specification for the new, hooray, hooray, higher in applications of mathematics suggests that learning for sustainability provides a range of possible contexts for the teaching of the course and for the new coursework elements. But actually, I think learning for sustainability is a context for more than just the higher apps course. And I've rewritten the Erin question to coincide with COP26. Now, a very small number of people in the world may be worried about the depreciation in the value of their yacht. But a lot more people, in fact, if you work on this question, you'll discover it's 320 million, will be forced into food scarcity if the global temperature rises causes, cause reductions in yield. And I think if pupils engage with tasks like this, they will develop a different perception of what maths is, as well as learning about their world. Now, much writing, scholarly writing about schooling, suggests it's a mechanism to entrench the status quo and reproduce social inequality. And whilst I believe that the work of people like Bernstein, Bourdieu, Gonzalez and Moll, and of course Foucault, are incredibly important in helping us to understand what's going on, I think in the end, I stand with the hopeful crew, with Frankenstein, Gutstein and Gutierrez. I believe there are ways to make educational transfor education transformative and that mass classrooms can be a site for challenging inequality. From a practical point of view, a maths lesson focused on real life data can give learners the opportunity to develop their understanding of statistics and to practice thinking critically. On the other hand, from a more like spiritual point of view, maths can be a source of comfort and reassurance. The pandemic is temporary, but maths isn't. You can take a break from COVID-19 by exploring patterns in number, geometry and rhythm. This leapt off the page when I read it, and I thought of children in lockdown making origami and playing mancala or trying to solve a fiendish problem. And this connection to well-being is something I really notice in Scotland as a huge difference from the education system in England. Maths is a source of joy and wonder, but school maths is not so very much always a safe space for all pupils. And perhaps the most controversial part of global citizenship in maths is questioning the practices that alienate children from the discipline. Practices of judging, ranking and labelling that derive from fixed ideas about innate ability. But that, I'm afraid, would be for another presentation. So going back to our map and a lovely discursive task that could be a starter in a mathematics classroom, I wonder what you've noticed. I wonder if you've counted how many colours there are. 
I wonder if you've spotted that one of the continents is missing and wondered why. Perhaps you've noticed that red and orange seem to be covering rather small parts of the globe compared with green. And if you want to find out more about this map, you might want to look at um, ZME Science. It's one of the 14 maps that they claim help us to make sense of the world. Thank you very much for listening today. Thank you so much, Corinne. We're going to move swiftly on now to um, Robert Richardson um, at the University of Glasgow, talking about creating well-designed and sustainable places in Scotland. What does it take? Uh, thanks very much to the SGSSS for the invitation to present. I'm Robert Richardson. I'm in the third year of a PhD in Urban Studies at the University of Glasgow. And my collaborative research with West Dunbartonshire Council aims to understand how the planning system can more consistently deliver sustainable and well-designed places. The design of our towns and cities is a crucial part of society's response to climate change. Well-designed places have a wide range of environmental, health, social and economic benefits. For example, research has shown that walkable and mixed-use neighbourhoods reduce reliance on cars and promote active travel, with clear advantages for carbon emissions, air quality and health. The same is true for places with high quality green networks and spaces. The main regulatory framework which guides new development, the planning system has great potential for embedding these characteristics into the places we live and work. The Planning Scotland Act 2019, the legal basis for the Scottish planning system, states that the purpose of planning is to manage the development and use of land in the long-term public interest. Responding to climate change is arguably the very definition of the long-term public interest. However, much of the new development that's actually being built in Scotland is simply not up to the task, despite the fact that national planning policy has long attempted to embed sustainability within decision making. I'm trying to understand why this implementation gap exists by focusing on the local level where most decisions on planning applications are made. The National planning framework provides the strategic foundation for national planning policy and local development plans, the basis for most planning decisions. The current national planning framework sets four outcomes for the planning system, that Scotland should be successful and sustainable, low carbon, natural and resilient and connected. The position statement ahead of the new national planning framework due to be published next year commits to promote the planning and development of healthier, inclusive, sustainable and well-designed places across Scotland. To achieve this, emphasis is placed on the concept of 20 minute neighbourhoods. This is the principle that high density, mixed use neighbourhoods allow people to live, work, shop and socialise within a 20 minute walk of home, reducing the need for unsustainable travel. Unfortunately, much of the new development being given planning permission in Scotland doesn't live up to this ambition. A stubborn example of this failure is private sector housing, which accounts for three quarters of newly built homes in Scotland each year. About two thirds of these are built by what we call volume house builders named this way because they're large companies which produce high volumes of homes and they also make high volumes of money. They're responsible for what are often criticised for being standardised or placeless housing estates, using very similar house types and road layouts. They're usually built on greenfield land in the suburbs and have limited access to public transport and local services, making residents dependent on car travel. The units are also built cheaply with poor quality materials, and sites tend to have limited green space and are largely tarmacked over to accommodate all the cars. The two pictures here are on the edges of Dumbarton and Kirk and Tillock, but really they could be anywhere. These are pretty much the opposite to the more sustainable design principles which national policy expects, such as the features of those 20 minute neighbourhoods. But as much as Scotland's new housing is built in this way, it provides a useful window into what exactly is going wrong within the planning system. My research is aiming to identify how this distance between policy and reality can be addressed. I'm doing this through case study research with a local planning authority, West Dunbartonshire Council, which has recently invested in mechanisms to proactively improve the design quality of new development. West Dunbartonshire is a small local authority area situated between Glasgow and Loch Lomond, with a population of just under 90,000, mostly based in Dunbarton and Clyde Bank. The area's identity derives largely from its shipbuilding heritage, which has been a double-edged sword as rapid deindustrialization has left a legacy of high unemployment and multiple deprivation. In conversations about climate change, the focus is often on national political leaders, not so much on the processes and debates taking place in council offices. But paying closer attention to the peopled nature of governance at local level is insightful for understanding how national policy aims are translated into decisions locally. 
The planning system is often seen, seen as an unwieldy monolithic bureaucracy, but it's actually very reliant on individual social relationships. Most new development is proposed by private developers and is then negotiated by local authority planners who try to secure outcomes which are more closely aligned with planning policy. Relationships between stakeholders across sectors are crucial to how the principles of national planning policy are enacted at street level, to borrow Michael Lipsky's term. As Lipsky argues, policy is only made when fully implemented through subsequent processes that cascade from initial declarations. My primary data is from qualitative semi-structured interviews with 37 key informants. Participants include Western Bartonshire Council planners, staff in related services and elected councillors, as well as private sector developers, architects and planning consultants who have been involved in development locally. I conducted a thematic analysis using MVivo to code interview transcripts and have supplemented this data with archival work from sources including local and national planning policy, local planning records, committee minutes and reports. I'll now explain how Western Bartonshire Council has undergone a culture change to prioritise planning outcomes in the long term public interest. I'll then discuss remaining barriers to this progress, particularly the impact of wider changes to the governance of the planning system. First, a noteworthy feature of the planning system is that decisions to approve or reject major developments are usually made by elected local councillors who often have little experience of planning as a discipline. This can provide the preconditions for short term priorities to dictate decisions. Until recently, councillors in Western Bartonshire had tended to prioritise short-term economic growth at the expense of longer-term outcomes. As a result, the area has a legacy of poorly designed development, which was approved because of the investment it would bring to the area. The first quote on the slide from a former councillor I interviewed demonstrates this mindset, that decisions were completely driven by economic development, despite the fact councillors knew they were approving totally substandard planning applications. Short-termism within government decision-making at national level is sometimes self-evident, but this can be equally true at local level, where councillors face pressure to deliver on manifesto promises if they're to be re-elected. These manifesto commitments tend to focus on politically popular, easily measurable aims, such as delivering a certain number of homes or creating a number of jobs. Planners I interviewed reported their view that the planning system is indeed being driven by housing number targets, without due emphasis on longer term priorities such as design quality and sustainability. One fact described the whole system as a numbers game. Similarly, everyday workflows are shaped by Scottish government targets, which expect local authorities to make decisions on planning applications within eight weeks, speed of decision being a particular priority for developers and investors. Querying the logic of prioritising speed over quality of outcome, Plan asked during our interview, is it a big deal that something took nine weeks rather than eight? This short term prioritisation is a contradiction to the purpose of planning and its ability to provide long term solutions to challenges like climate change. However, West Dunbartonshire Council has sought to address this and has established longer term planning and design outcomes as a strategic priority. In 2017, despite severe financial pressure, the council committed to invest £75,000 a year to create and support a full-time staff position, place and design officer, to drive forward an internal culture change. This agenda was driven by key champions within the council, which demonstrates the importance of skilled leaders for instituting change. The council's investment was led particularly by the then elected deputy leader, who was assisted by a planning service manager, who both spent much of the year persuading colleagues, including politicians and officers, to support their proposal. This involved collating evidence from other local authorities to promote the long-term benefits of well-designed places, with support from external organisations, including the Scottish Government. To increase the chances of success, planning managers have developed mechanisms for capacity building with elected councillors, addressing a knowledge deficit which often surfaced during decision making. For example, planners conduct regular informal briefings for councillors on major planning applications to appraise them of key information and facilitate conversations about design and place quality. These elected member briefings won a Scottish Government Award for planning in 2018 and have helped to continually educate and engage councillors on these issues. Likewise, site visits to exemplars of well-designed development, including the high-profile regeneration projects at King's Cross in London, have raised ambition among councillors. Those politicians are now showing more interest in the longer-term outcomes of planning work. The final quotes on the slide from two councillors I interviewed demonstrate this change in mindset. The first stated that it's about getting quality built rather than just getting something done quickly, despite pressure from voters. 
And the second agrees that councillors are seeing the benefits of thinking longer term. On this slide are two examples of how a longer term concern for sustainability has been embedded within the council's planning activities. The first is the council's local development plan two, which is currently awaiting adoption. It was awarded the Building with Nature Excellence Award for a green infrastructure first approach to new development. The award is a benchmark for green infrastructure developed by the University of the West of England. And West Dunbartonshire's is the first development plan in the UK to be awarded this. The second example is the £20 million district heating network at Queen's Quay in Clyde Bank, the first large scale water source heat pump of its kind in Scotland. The network has the ability to provide renewable energy to a thousand homes on the site in future. So it's a significant initial investment with a long payback period. A strategic director at Western Bartonshire Council described projects such as this using a very apt metaphor, planting trees under whose shade we will never sit. These are council led successes. However, extending this to other stakeholders is not straightforward, particularly private sector developers. Here I want to return to the example of the standardized volume house builder estates. As I described earlier, the planning system requires councils to deliver a certain number of housing units. They're reliant financially on the income from council tax receipts from those homes, from planning application fees, and often the sale of council land for development. Planning authorities also find it difficult to reject housing development on design and quality grounds. Decisions can be appealed to Scottish government ministers who have tended to downplay design concerns in their decisions. Local authorities are therefore under significant pressure to accept housing proposals, particularly areas with a weak local economy and low land values like Western Bartonshire. Housing developers therefore hold significant power in this relationship. The business models of most house builders mean that design features which provide social benefits, such as green space and pedestrian connections, are unprofitable. These features can be described as positive externalities, which would require the developer to deviate from a rigid standardized business model without achieving a proportionate financial return. House builders simply argue that the features which encourage more sustainable places make a site financially unviable. Local authority planners can try to negotiate and push developers to improve their proposals, but achieving any substantial change is very difficult. Discussing a recent housing development site in Dumbarton, planners I interviewed felt they'd successfully persuaded the private developer to improve some elements of the proposal, including the retention of several trees and the use of higher quality construction materials. One described this process of negotiation as being like putting with the developer retrofitting green infrastructure to the site rather than prioritizing it from the outset. However, another planner also readily accepted they had needed to compromise on the design of the site. Collaboration and compromise are key cultural dynamics of the Scottish planning system, but surely this is problematic if the sustainability priorities and national policy are being openly compromised. The reality is that we cannot afford to compromise on climate change. That's a quote taken directly from the position statement for the upcoming fourth national planning framework. Many private developers will not or cannot deviate substantially from a business model which is ill-equipped to deliver well-designed and sustainable development. The developer responsible for the site in Dumbarton summarized this aptly at the bottom of the slide there. We want to create sustainable communities, but we're a business at the end of the day and we have to make money. How compatible are those business interests with the need to create sustainable places if we really cannot compromise on climate change. This final point is particularly salient at a time when we're seeing a shifting balance of power within the planning system, away from the state and towards private business interests, including developers. Austerity has played a major role in this. Since 2009, Scottish local, planning service, local government planning services have experienced a 42% reduction in budgets and nearly a one third reduction in staffing. This reduced capacity means that planning authorities are increasingly having to outsource work to private consultants, who often work for local authorities and private developers at the same time. A wider neoliberalisation of the planning system is occurring, in which the capacity and power of the state is weakening, with the private sector increasingly delivering planning services. The impact on how the public interest is being upheld and how challenges like climate change can be addressed requires further scrutiny. At street level, Cuts the capacity have added significant pressure to the everyday work of Western Bartonshire Council's planners. Many interview participants reflected on the challenge at the planning service, as a planner quoted on the slide reported, does not have enough people to do the day job. Another described the pressure of running around with your hair on fire, 
to justify your existence amid the threat of further cuts. Despite Western Bartonshire's successes in changing its decision-making culture, these pressures undoubtedly threaten the ability of public sector planners to deliver creative and effective solutions to long-term policy challenges like climate change. To conclude, Western Bartonshire Council's experience reveals how local authorities need skilled leaders. As well as having planning and design skills, they must be good communicators who can change minds and practices. This requires an astute political awareness to collaborate effectively with elected decision makers. Planning authorities should therefore be empowered and re resourced to recruit, train and retain skilled staff. The current trajectory of the planning system raises significant questions about where the next generation of public sector leaders will come from. There's also a role for closer ties between professionals, politicians and universities in knowledge sharing and capacity building. Additionally, within existing development market structures, a more radical national policy and regulatory framework is required if private sector developers are to be shifted from their business model. Policy could set out more specifically what the features of sustainable, zero carbon, well-designed places are so that poorly designed development can be confidently refused planning permission. The political will to do this needs to exist first. Ultimately, social science research can deepen our understanding of how the stakeholders responsible for delivering the built environment behave and what motivates them. This knowledge should help in the design of policy which is responsive to our governance systems. In the context of my research, this should take particular account of the growing power of private interests and the changing role of the state within the planning system. Thanks very much for listening. If anyone's interested, there are references to the material I've used there on the slides on Miro, so do have a look at those. I do hope I've not overrun too badly. Thanks very much. Just a couple minutes, fun. Thank you very much, Robert. So what we, we did have um, slightly, we built in a bit of extra time um, just in case we did run over, but we've got a few minutes now for questions for Corinne and Robert. So before we, we sort of ask the, the expert panel to sort of any reflections they've got, are there any from the audience we have here? Is there any questions for Corinne or Robert on what they have just presented? Could I invite the, the experts um, to, to any reflections they have on what we have just heard? Hello, thank you very much to both speakers for fascinating talks. Um, fascinating, but slightly, uh, secondly, in the case of the second talk, um, it made me feel slightly pessimistic, I have to admit. Um, but I have a question, first of all, for Karina, I think. Uh, so I work, I work quite a lot in learning for sustainability and education for sustainable development. So I was really interested in how your math teachers are responding to this notion. And I wasn't quite clear about your recommendations at the end. So I thought that your suggested SQA paper question was lovely as an example of the specific, but at the very beginning, you talked about the generic competencies and the kind of challenges of trying for maths teachers to try to support generic competencies, as well as specific examples. And I wondered whether you came to any kind of resolution or you have done yet about how maths teaching can support some of those generic competencies as well as the specifics. Oh, well, that's interesting. I've got lots of um, suggestions for how it, that might occur. Um, and I think there is huge potential, um, particularly in the BGE, but which is the, the early part of secondary school, but not only there. Um, but I think the issue is, is the, um, how the mathematics teachers themselves feel that they're, you know, they're, where they feel their responsibilities lie, I suppose. Um, and I think there are some tensions, which is why I'm, my research is focused on um, the teachers who've come forward, the maths teachers who've volunteered and, and want to be involved in, in the work with um, Scott Deck. So I'm sort of, I'm kind of focusing on the ones that are really enthusiastic about this and are thinking more broadly about the purposes of maths. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to try to um, draw out some, some positive stories and exemplars really, because teachers I think are very much, impacted by stories of what other people are doing in the classroom um, and if you see somebody else doing something and achieving something and it working then you're much more likely to have a go at it yourself um, I, I yeah I, I think there's huge potential but it's 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 how teachers feel kind of um, able to take on different different approaches I suppose thank you very much thank um, you Ian thanks Sandra um, I've probably got about 20 questions for Robert, but I'll try and stick to one. Uh, I was really interested, Robert, in what you thought about both the officers and the elected councillors that you spoke to and what their sense of 
place and sense of identity was. And I'm particularly interested to know if any of them expressed anything that they thought was distinctive about those places that you mentioned the uh, particular developments in, because one one of the characteristics of Scottish local government, of course, is that our th many of our 32 local authorities are actually quite randomly drawn and not especially rooted in history. And Western Barton is one of those examples because it's like a fragment of an old county. So um, I saw the picture of the building at Queen's Quay, which is obviously meant to be reminiscent of industrial buildings in Clyde Bank. But how does, how does that feed through into their general perception of what building in the built environment is for in their local places? Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think Western Barton is such an interesting area because of that identity. Um, a lot of the, the history and the, the sense of place is rooted in that sort of post-industrial legacy. So at Kirao Clyde Bank, where shipbuilding was, was a huge industry that the place grew around. Um, but of course, I, I mentioned it's a double-edged sword and it's, you know, as well as the fact it was the huge employment base for a long time. It's also the collapse of shipbuilding there was resp isn't responsible for a, a pretty traumatic legacy of unemployment, deprivation, vacant land, etc. Um, so there's a real challenge there in terms of recycling that identity so that new development pays due attention and respect to the, to the history of the area, but also takes it forward. Um, and I think on the, on the second one, I, I think there's an interesting dynamic going forward for the area in its relationship to Glasgow, because obviously it's literally right on the cusp of Glasgow, Clyde Bank. You, you don't notice sort of walking from Clyde Bank to Yoka, where you cross the local authority boundary. Um, and as an area within the wider city region, I think Western Bartonshire has got quite an interesting challenge there in terms of how it retains a unique identity that um, keeps a sense of place that isn't just being a sort of a suburb in Glasgow, but also benefits from the transport connections and the economic um, links that it has with, with the wider city. Um, and that's something that the council has been trying to balance quite judiciously, I think. Um, a really good example of that is Queen's Quay, the site of that Dash district heating network, which is on the site of a former shipyard, John Brown's shipyard, one of the biggest um, in Scotland for, for a long time. Um, and there's been some quite interesting work on, on how to sort of balance that relationship using public artwork and street naming and that sort of thing to try and pay attention and, and respect the history, but, but sort of create a new sense of place at the same time. Thank you very much, Robert. So quickly over now to Lorenzo. Um, Sapochetti, did, did I say that? <laughs> how do I say your surname? Sapochetti, yes. Yeah, yes. exactly what I said, yeah, definitely. Thank you. <laughs> um, learning to transition, proposals from the Italian energy community. So over to you, Lorenzo. Hi, everyone, and thank you to the SGSSS for organizing this. I am a PhD student in the Department of Social Anthropology at the University of St. Andrews and member of the Center for Energy Ethics. In this presentation, I will share some preliminary observation based on ongoing ethnographic fieldwork that I'm conducting in an Italian renewable energy cooperative called Nostra. This case study sets an example of how renewable energy communities can become hubs for learning and transformative action in the context of energy transition. As our societies become increasingly energy intensive, we need to find ways of transitioning to low carbon systems where citizens, not just governments and companies can be directly involved. Renewable energy communities can provide just and equitable solutions to climate change and growing energy demands. For instance, communities can reach high degrees of ownership and control of energy projects, increase their participation in energy decisions and local autonomy and benefit collectively uh, from the outcomes through energy saving and even revenue generation. They can be defined as community economies engaged with small scale energy presumption, which basically means consuming the energy that you yourself produce, or medium scale renewable energy presumption and sale according to alternative ways of ownership, production, exchange, and circulation. In the literature, renewable energy communities have mostly been uh, typologized as community of place or communities of interest. A community of place is defined by the spatial continuity of its members. It can be a neighborhood, uh, a village, a town, a borough, or even a municipality. Instead, a community of interest is associated with a group of individuals who share a common interest without necessarily living in the same geographical area. The most widespread energy community of this type is a group of people who invest in cooperative projects. Although in Nostra, the Italian cooperative at the center of my research can be seen as a community of interest, it also makes an interesting case for a third overlapping type, which I call an energy community of practice. 
For my research, I'm using multimodal ethnographic method, including a mix of online and in-person te research te techniques that also allows me to deal with the constraints of the pandemic. So far, I have attended a number of webinars and online workshops. I've done participant ob observation on several online and in-person events, conducted one-to-one -one interviews, and more recently started collaborating with the Nostra team on some of its projects. So what is a Nostra? A Nostra, which in Italian means it is ours, is a cooperative which operates in the national energy market, both as a producer and supplier of electricity from you know, renewable sources. It is based in Milan and has around 9,000 members from across Italy. But how does the energy they exchange work within the cooperative? To understand this, we need to look at the structure of a Nostra. Members can be individuals, households, businesses, and civil society organizations. They can either be customer only or producers and customers who sell electricity produced by their own plants into the cooperative and then they repurchase it as final customers. And Nostra buys electricity from certified uh, power plants whose productions, uh, mostly for photovoltaics, comply with the environmental sustainability criteria and for businesses with CSR criteria. The co-op buys the remaining share on the market and Nostra has also launched a fundraising campaign for members to directly invest in, the, in projects for collectively owned renewable power plants. These members are called financing members and can benefit from dedicated tariffs. The first entire member financed power plant has been recently launched. And Nostra members can also count on a network of energy experts and technicians associated with the cooperative for energy efficiency and energy saving services from installing technologies to help you navigate energy uh, feeding tariffs. Finally, a staff of professionals in different areas uh, from administration to customer health, communication, community engagement, and more recently, activation of other renewable energy communities and a board of director complete the cooperative structure. This is the first uh, entirely members financed uh, power plant, which is a 900 kilowatts wind turbine located on a hill near Gubbio in central Italy and produces up to 1.1 gigawatt per year and supplies around 900 households. Why do I call a Nostra community of practice? According to educational theorist Etienne Van Gaer, a community of practice is not merely a community of interest. Its members are practitioners and they develop a shared repertoire of resources, experiences, tools, stories, and ways of addressing recurring problems. As a cooperative, all members can participate in the in, in Nostra. They can participate in the annual meetings to vote on, uh, on a one head, one vote basis on relevant issues presented by the board of directors and bring up pertinent other issues. In the last couple of years, some have shown a willingness to be involved more directly and consistently in the cooperative life. In short, they want to become active members. So the board of directors uh, started setting, setting up a participatory pathway to achieve the following goals. Enhance the communication between them and its social basis, implement actions that allow for different degrees of involvement, improve the involvement of members in the cooperative choices about specific, specific themes, for example, the development of new projects or a discussion of new business models, and activate relationship among the members. The board of directors extended the proposal to all members and around 100 responded positively. These active members who will meet regularly to share experiences, strategies and actions and learn from each other about community engagement in order to recruit more members and promote a culture of energy in the, in the local communities. Those who live in the same area uh, have managed to find local groups and work together already. What practices have I encountered in, in, the last, in this first period of fieldwork in Enostra? At the end of last year, uh, Enostra staff, with the help of, of some uh, action research, research professionals, organized a series of Zoom meetings where active members from across the nation could meet to share community engagement practices and work out shared practices to involve other people. Many of them are part of other groups, such as environmental association, ethical finance groups, solidarity economy organizations, and transition towns. A small number has already been engaged in funding uh, prospective members for the cooperative and developed some initiatives to involve them. 
For example, in one Zoom meeting, two members volunteered to share uh, an initiative which is called uh, Ceneta Bolletta, which in English, uh, in English means build in there. This practice consists of inviting uh, to dinner friends or relatives sensitive to topics like uh, environmental sustainability and solidarity economy and explain why Nostra is a fair, ethical and sustainable choice uh, as an energy provider. Another Zoom meeting was dedicated to finding new strategies to involve more members in this part participatory pathway in, in the local groups. While another Zoom meeting addressed the question of what action can be used to promote a culture of energy in the local communities. Beside the meetings, Enostra staff has started organizing a playlist of webinars uh, on the YouTube channel. These webinars are focused on various uh, energy matters such as energy saving, the energy market, the fundraising campaign that they've launched for uh, financing members and feeding tariffs. They are thought of as material to help members improve their knowledge of the energy matters. Finally, one local group, the one in Milan, held an info session on Zoom last summer where they explained the values embraced by the Nostra community and the service that it offers. Some of the participants were solidarity-based purchase groups, members, and other were people who had heard of the cooperative on the social media and, or elsewhere. A similar info session, uh, this time in presence, was recently hosted by another local group, the one in Como Varese, in Northern Italy as well, during a solidarity economy fair in this area. Before concluding, I want to highlight some of the opportunities that uh, the energy community of practice may provide to the cooperative and to the broader society. Acting locally surely represents a mean for increasing a nostril social basis, which is witnessed by the around uh, 1,000 new contracts signed in the last year. It also presents citizens who cannot install renewable technology in their homes to become virtual, virtual prosumers. As for the promotion of a culture of energy beyond, beyond the cooperative, which is a mission uh, of the cooperative and it's uh, recognized in its statute, local groups and active members have the potential to involve associations, solidarity economy groups and local authorities. This represents a great chance to preserve them to take up and help implement new renewable energy projects in, in the local communities. They also can become, uh, the members can also become better equipped to, to navigate the energy efficiency feeding tariffs to their own benefit and to disseminate their, their skills and knowledge in their networks. Of course, also criticalities have emerged during this part of the research. The practitioners have themselves started to address some of them. For example, a, a risk of remaining confined to circles of environmentalism and alter economies, for example, circular economies, solidarity economies, and so on. Although it has been discussed during meetings that diverse groups should be targeted, the main interlocutors of the community of practice seem to remain solidarity-based purchase groups and other solidarity economy groups and association. It is also difficult to assess whether technology enables active members to engage with the learning materials and the, tool uh, and the toolkit made uh, available by the board of directors. It also seems to be a different level of engagement between local groups in Northern Italy who have begun to engage locally and groups in Central and Southern Italy. Finally, Enostra has registered a uh, dominant presence of male members in the participatory pathway and the, in the cooperative more in general, except the staff. The cooperative is addressing uh, this problem and is working out a strategy to bridge the gender gap and is primarily working alongside other European cooperatives in EU funded projects. To wrap up this, pre this presentation, I just want to point out the two main contributions that I aim to make with research, which is still ongoing. On the one hand, I want to expand the notion of community renewable energy and respond to the need for CRE scholarship to shift the focus from meaning to practice. On a more practical level, I aim to offer insights on how transformative strategies, uh, strategies and actions emerge and how, how they can be improved that could be used by other community energy projects. Thank you for listening to me today. It's fantastic. So we're going to go jump to the next speaker. I've just noticed there were a couple of questions in the chat um, for Robert and Corinne. I've copied and pasted them into Miro. Uh, Miro. Um, uh, Corinne and Robert, if, if you happen to be good with Miro, maybe you can actually answer them in writing on the board just to help with time. Otherwise, we'll come back to them later. So thank you very much, Lorenzo. We're going to jump now um, to our next speaker, um, who is 
um, Dave Namusanya, Namusanya um, who will be talking on the rains are unpredictable these days, ecological grief over water in South Malawi. Thank you. Uh, so I am Devi, uh, Devi Namusanya. I am a PhD student at the University of uh, Abate in Dundee. I am currently in my second year and I'm conducting a field work in uh, southern Malawi from where I'm joining you from um, in the districts of uh, Blanche and Molange. My research is on ecological grief, climate change and changing water practices in Malawi. I will start by giving you a brief uh, layout of the, of the presentation. So I'll start with giving you the research problem. And from there, I'll move to the uh, research context and then I'll present on the methodology and the findings. And I'll conclude by presenting on the imagined water future in uh, Southern Malawi. So I will start by unpacking the key issues. And then my research is uh, uh, hinged on at least four statements. The first one is on uh, uh, researching the expressions of ecological grief in the Malawian context. Uh, this is mostly informed by works of other scholars who have advanced that although the experience of climate change are almost similar, the expressions of these experiences are not all the same. And thus there is a mantra that grief is universal, but the expression of it is not universal. The second guiding statement uh, for my research is, um, is that I have been interested in understanding water practices under climate impacted communities. It is the case that water has been one of the natural resources whose presence has been impacted on by climate change. In the context of uh, Malawi, however, there has been little research on uh, such impacts. Also, I am interested in understanding the adaptive strategies that communities in Malawi are employing in the face of climate change. The question in this case that I've been asking is, in the face of changing water practices, how are communities in Malawi adapting to such changes? How are they surviving? Um, I am also interested, uh, and this is mostly for policy purposes, I have been researching on how resilience efforts can be built or supported in these communities that are mostly bearing the brunt of climate change uh, with fewer adaptive strategies. In a moment, I'll be telling you how I've been able to address the research problems. But before that, let me just give you a context of the area that I've been researching on, as some of you might not be familiar with Malawi. So Malawi is located in South East Africa. It is surrounded by three other countries. As you can see on the map, we have the list Tanzania, uh, Zambia, and, and Mozambique. A former British colony, it is a little smaller than uh, Scotland, yet has a population about four times uh, that of uh, Scotland. As of last year, it was estimated that uh, there are at least 19.13 million people living in Malawi. Most of uh, Malawi's population lives in the rural area in which the majority rely on, uh, on farming. I would claim as well that this over-reliance on agriculture has made it one of the poorest in the world, with some records indicating that it has the fourth highest percentage of poor people in the world. These numbers are relevant for this presentation because evidence uh, in literature and from elsewhere has already showed that uh, it is the poorest countries actually on, the, on earth that are bearing a significant brunt of climate change. Uh, thus, as much of Malawi's population is susceptible to climate change impacts. My research has been conducted uh, in two districts of Southern Malawi, and that's Blantia and Mulanje uh, district. Blantia, as the name might actually suggest, is a city uh, district that got its name from the Scottish city of the same name. Whereas Mulanje, on the other hand, is a rural district. Uh, this is a home to vast fields of tea estates that were set up by colonialists. They are still a, pro a predominant feature up to date. This is significant uh, because in imagining and shaping the future of water practices in this area, it will have to be considered that the demand will always be split among as the interests of the communities as well as the interests of the tea estates. I should highlight, however, that my presentation, which is just a part of the findings that I've gathered this far, will be dwelling on the work that I've been conducting in Molange district. So this is the rural district and not in Blanta where I'm presenting. Um, in the next slide, I'll give you uh, more detail on the work that I have conducted before taking you through the findings from the, from my re from the research. So my research has been a confluence of at least two approaches. One is an African approach, and another is what would pass for a, a Western approach. I grounded my research in the African philosophy of communitarian living that is known as Ubuntu. In brief, um, this philosophy is defined as the knowledge that I am 
because you are, that our existence as humans depends much on the affirmation and the acceptance of others, that to destroy another person is to destroy oneself. Uh, it's the merit standing, which I also highlight as I progress with the, with the, with, with the presentation. Um, this approach has given me the chance to live within the communities conducting research. Uh, thus, I've been in the communities for at least seven months, observing practices around water and understanding expressions of ecological grief. Um, so in brief, I would say that I have been doing uh, ethnography uh, in, the, in the areas. In Malawi, it would be hard actually to have conversations on water without involving women and girls. Thus, I have also been doing, and I've just completed focus group discussions with women as well as school going girls. In the picture, it is one of the uh, focus group discussions that I had with, uh, with young girls uh, for whom much of the domestic chores involving water for, I, I am sure that you can actually see me. I am the one who is not a girl there. Uh, these observations actually, and participating in communal life as well as conversations did not just give me the information I needed for the research. They also gave me, gave the participating communities a sense of power to tell their own stories and experiences. This is yet an important feature that has been missing in the conversation on climate change. Uh, those who have been following uh, proceedings at the COP26 can actually agree that this issue of representation has also been significant in the discussions there. Anyway, uh, let, let me now give a brief overview of the significant theme of this research, ecological grief, uh, before I move to the key findings for my research. Ecological grief is a term that has been popularized by two Australian scholars, uh, Neville Ellis and Ashley Consolo, and it's described as the emotional response to loss or even an anticipated loss of uh, features due to climate change. It is not just about the features, it is also grief over the impacts of climate change. This emotional response is mostly appreciated from the psychological reaction to the loss. There have been instances where people have reported feelings of anxiety, depression and stress over the loss of features due to climate change. Others have reported similar feelings over the future. In, in asking what sort of a future will we have or what sort of a future will our descendants have. In some other contexts, however, this response is over the loss of physical features. Climate change, for instance, has led to the drying out of dams or other water sources in some communities. The response to such losses uh, is what would trigger ecological grief. Uh, this would also be applicable uh, to future loss where in some other communities, people are watching significant physical features actually diminish from, uh, literally speaking, we would say the face of the earth. Uh, and apart from that, another feature actually, uh, other features that are going missing, um, knowledge. So there is also, there are instances where knowledge over the weather or climate is becoming irrelevant. In some other cultures, people have been able to predict significant weather events with near precision. In Malawi, for instance, almost every child who was historically raised uh, with some indigenous knowledge of the weather, people could tell when it would rain and if the rains would be heavy or not, or if there would be a cycle. However, as the impacts of climate change are worsening, this knowledge is becoming obsolete. Now, with that out of the way, let me take you to some of the findings that I have in relation to ecological grief over water in Malawi. At the outset, I should point out that expressions of ecological grief are there in Southern Malawi. However, if one were to come and look for psychological reactions to the loss of ecological features or the anticipated impacts of climate change, the chances are that they will return almost empty, empty handed. A climate change skeptic might even be forced to conclude that there is no climate change in Malawi. The impacts are barely felt by the people, a line that I have been frequently met uh, by climate change skeptics. However, this is not true. Uh, the problem is that the state of mental health in Malawi is already poor. Compa it's mostly compounded by beliefs and other cultural practices, and sometimes even poverty. So issues of mental health are pushed to the peripheral of public or even private conversation. With, for example, right now, Malawi is battling a rise in, in suicide cases. There are actually only about five psychiatrists. In this context, then, it would be hard to expect that there would be psychological expressions of climate change that would be considered uh, seriously. If anything, however, uh, these psychological responses are mostly felt in, in reaction to natural disasters. For instance, there was a flooding in 2019 uh, that led to loss of lives. Then it was actually expected that people were going to grieve and people really did grieve for the, for the loss of lives as well as property. Um, one thing that is important, however, and that I should highlight is that there is change and 
this change actually is being noticed. A community member expressed to me that the world is changing. Um, as you can see in the, in the quotation uh, below there, that is what they said to me, that it makes you worried of the world the kids are going to inherit because the world is changing. In, in terms of water in Malawi, much of it is understood along the lines of rainfall. Uh, as I highlighted earlier, most people in Malawi actually rely on agriculture, and this is rain-fed agriculture. That's one of the ways that ecological grief is expressed in Malawi is through the loss of previously held knowledge over the weather and climate. I arrived back in Malawi on 12 December 2020. In most communities, they had planted as the, uh, they had just planted as the rains had started late November. According to a participant in Mulanje district, where I'm, I, am, I am doing the research, they said these days it is quite hard to predict when the rains will start. Um, so that's the first condition that is there. That's what they told me about the unpredictability of the rains. Not only, however, are the periods of rain onset unpredictable, rains are also unreliable. In my observations and conversations, one of the things that people have been highlighting in relation to rainfall is that you cannot always be sure when it starts, if it has started for good. As I am talking right now, some communities in Malawi, in Mulanje district have already planted beans because it rained about two weeks ago. However, there have been no rain since then in the district. If it does not rain again in the next two weeks, which I think is more likely, then the planted means might go to waste and farmers may need to replant. Also, if it rains and then kind of prove my prediction wrong, then it means that a good number of other farmers who have to uh, who have planted late and be at risk of poor harvest if the rain, rain stop area. Not only, however, are the rains unpredictable and even showing signs of unreliability, they have also been said to be destructive. In the last rainy season, unlike the, when, the one before it, where, where the, when there was cyclone Idai, there were no reported cases of flooding. Uh, this, in some way, masks the reality of the destructiveness of the rainy season. In Chibadi village, however, where I am also conducting my research, it was reported by community members that houses were destroyed due to heavy rainfall. Likening the rains to a war, a community member told me what's the second quote there, that when the rains come, actually you think it is a war. It causes total destruction. Also of importance to note is that much of the knowledge that people had over rains, and that means water, is becoming irrelevant. There are instances when people told me that it would rain that day, only for the rain clouds to gather and disperse without raining. One time we went up the mountain because Mulanje district is, is just at the foot of, 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 of a mountain. And, and then we were told that it was safe to go up the mountain. They said that with the, way, the weather had been the past days and other ways of understanding weather, it would not rain. However, while we were up the mountain, it literally rained on our parade with the guys that I went to. Uh, some people might say, well, that's just a simple miscalculation of the weather. Well, the weather is always unpredictable. It might be. But the conversations that I have been having with community members have reported that they are struggling to tell about the weather. They are saying that their knowledge is actually being off mark. Of course, when I talk to the younger generations, they say it is their parents that had a better understanding of the weather. They say it's no longer irrelevant. We have got access to apps that will tell us about the weather. Whereas the older generation as well say that the world is just changing and they can't tell uh, about the weather with uh, near precision. Apart from the loss of knowledge over the weather, there has also been noted a significant loss of key physical features. Now, I should add here that most of these things actually are interrelated. These significant changes in the weather that are being noticed, and they are also making the knowledge of the weather become obsolete, are also reflected in the physical features. In the picture above, what you're seeing there is Ruo River. This is one of the biggest rivers coming out of Mulanje Mountain. Currently, there is an electricity power plant on some part of the river because historically, Ruo has had high water levels. In 2015, Ruo River was filled with a lot of water that it flooded and caused significant damage all the way into Zambezi River. Uh, the photo was taken in June uh, this year, uh, which, is, which might be about three months after what has to be the actual rainy season in Malawi. In this period, however, the water levels had significantly dropped, resembling to what some community members said was its October levels. October is the hottest and driest, and driest month in Malawi. A participant made those remarks actually pertaining to the water levels in, in Ruo River. While I would think that it would be dishonest to say that Ruo River has died, it however appears that it is a river which will no longer be as the people knew it. The Ruo that has been historically known will be dead and instead it will be replaced by a smaller sized 
Ruo River. In some other areas, however, this loss of uh, physical features has been real. In the photo below, that of Ruo is another that I got from a village, from, from a village known as Benes. Now, now, what is remaining there is just a small patch of water. However, I was told that prior, uh, a community member who is about who is in his 70s told me that prior before now, uh, the area that is now a garden that you can see there as a garden and with a small patch of water, it used to be a dam. He told me that there used to be a dam here, water, fish and everything was here. These days it is just a small stream. It is also because the rain stopped area this time, just enough for a harvest. These experiences are noted. How then do the local people interpret these experiences? Do they say, for instance, that the world around us is changing and this is our doing, we should do something about it? I found out that the most prominent way through which these experiences are expressed is through religion. Most members of the community say that all the things happening, it is because the world is coming to an end. It is a predominantly Christian area. So much of their understanding is rooted in Christianity. Thus, they say that the adverse events happening just mean that the second coming of Jesus Christ is near. A participant told me what's in the first quote there. Um, and then they say that there is nothing that they can do about it. At the same time, however, it, it, it's also interesting to note that the community members acknowledge that the changes are human induced. However, what they say is that it is not them doing the harm. They would rather place it on some people from other areas, are mostly planter. Uh, which is the urban area. So for instance, there are business people who are licensed by the forestry department to cut down old trees from the mountain at a fee which is paid to the Malawi government. This fee is then used to replace the trees. The people accuse such people of destroying the environment. I talked about the philosophy of Ubuntu as a framework for my research. I should also have added that it regulates life in the communities that I've been researching. A thing that I have read about the philosophy is that it seeks to protect people who are a part of the community while seeking to label unkindly those outside of it. That can be seen in how the people prefer to place the blame on harming the environment on those from outside, while among us themselves, a charcoal business thrives. As you can see in the photo, local people are the ones selling charcoal. Yet among the local communities, they say the harm to the environment is just caused by the outsiders, as you can see in the second quotation. Uh, their own harm, in a way is significantly uh, minimized. Let me now come to the theme of this event and, and I should con be concluding my presentation as well. I would like to imagine how other futures can be shaped in Southern Malawi. The most important thing is to acknowledge that religion shapes and orders society in these communities. Thus the issue of climate change should be rooted within religious context and religious texts. I am not much of a religious person, but at least I've got an idea that most of the religions actually are hold through the golden rule of loving others and protecting them in the same way that we do to ourselves. Um, so I think that referring to such would be useful and relatable in contexts such as this. At the same time, much of the conversation on climate change in, in these areas has been driven, and in most areas actually has been driven by science, which in a way seems to be in conflict with faith. As a result, religious leaders actually are placed outside of the conversation. But I think in a context like Malawi, these people are important and they should be involved in such a conversation and they should be allowed to take a leading role. At the same time, I think it is also important to have issues of climate change rooted in local experiences. As it is, I have established that much of the issues to do with climate change are not local. That for example, when people are told about building glaciers, they are wondering, what is that to us? Uh, thus, there is a need then to have them in local narratives, focusing on local experiences. Climate change is a global challenge. However, its experience remains local and expressing it should be sensitive to such local realities. I am aware that some scholars have advocated for an Ubuntu approach to addressing climate change. Uh, most of these scholars are from, are from Sub-Saharan Africa, but Ubuntu is firstly concerned with the local before it's concerned with the national. This is something that I've also learned. And then we can't actually talk about the global before talking about uh, the local. Uh, at the same time, there is a need of building a conversation around imagined water futures. In two of the villages that I've been researching on, one can say that they are water abundant. Water levels are dropping in rivers, but they, have, but they still have water. They say that, well, if, when the water levels are dropping, it's just part of the season. Conversations on water shortages were almost foreign to them. 
However, when the conversations on imagined water futures, of, it was the conversations on imagined water futures that often triggered relatable responses. As one of my participants said, water is life, and therefore we need to make sure that it is preserved. They could not imagine a future of water shortages. If it is within their power, what I gathered from these participants is that they can take action to avoid such a future. Finally, as the outlook and structuring of society in these communities is built on a communal outlook to life, I do think that there is a need to use such structures in climate change conversation. Uh, from my research, I've established that efforts that appear to ignore the communal structures do not leave lasting impact. It is the ownership of the projects by the people that has got an impact. Um, I would like to thank the communities and chiefs in the areas that I've been researching, as well as my supervisors, and some of the community members who have actually been significant in helping me to have access to some of the key members in the community, as well as Abate University for funding the research. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. But what I would like to do now is, is, is open a, a question for um, our expert panel. Um, so hopefully all four are here. And the question I would like them to ask them is, Reflecting on the presentations you've seen, um, what do you see, wh where can you see the benefits of interdisciplinary work? And where do you see the challenges and potential of linking this work to current debates as you know them? So the public engagement aspects. So reflection on the value of interdisciplinary and public engagement, reflecting on your own work and, and what you've seen there. So, Deirdre, can I pick on you? Yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> pick on me sounds a bit strong. If we aim, if we aim for about two or three minutes for your response. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for the presentations. They were all really interesting. Um, one of the threads that I felt ran through each of the presentations was around well-being. And one of the things that I think is really important when we're moving towards um, a more sustainable and, and climate-friendly future is um, including well-being as part of that. Um, so when I was listening to Corrine's um, presentations, one of presentation, one of the things that I was thinking about was um, around a challenge for teachers in terms of well-being and embedding um, this change in practice. Um, similarly with Robert's presentation, um, I guess the, the kind of speed <laughs> at which um, people are, are required to engage in every day didn't, didn't offer that opportunity. Um, to think about well-being um, in that space. And I guess with Dave's presentation, that very much comes to the fore in terms of the community um, and likewise with um, Lorenzo. So I guess what, um, what a, um, a concept like that really does offer is that interdisciplinary perspective, which comes from, um, as Dave said, the, the scientific perspective and um, the, the religious um, perspective, thinking about those people who are engaging um, in these changes um, in practice on the ground, as well as kind of understanding um, the, the, the impact of the policy implications on that. So I guess the need, um, a concept like that makes me think about the need for a holistic um, system change um, in this particular area. And I guess um, thinking about interdisciplinary aspects in my own work, um, what I would say just briefly is that um, I had the, the privilege of having um, ESRC funding to run an interdisciplinary series um, over a, a number of years and on the subject of consumption ethics. And that was such a valuable experience in bringing different disciplinary perspectives together um, in terms of the same topic, which really allowed us to spark new ideas and different ways of thinking about um, issues as well as um, the collaborations that came out from that. And some of the things that did come out from that were around bringing those, collecting those um, disciplinary perspectives together, um, both in terms of academic outputs, but also in terms of practice. So one of the spaces that we did actually go into was um, schools where we got teachers across different disciplines to look at this particular subject and how then they could uh, embed that across um, their teaching. In your, your reflections on, on the presentations you've heard today, um, both in terms of the value of interdisciplinary, inter, interdisciplinarity and linking um, this work to sort of current uh, debates and the potential for that sort of public engagement. 
Thanks, Andrew. Um, so first of all, I really enjoyed all of those. Thanks very much to everybody who's put all the, the time and effort into such excellent presentations today. <clears throat> Andrew, I'm, I'm remembered as reminded, sorry, as I always am, of my single most favourite quote I've ever read in 25 years of being an academic. And it's from an American sociologist called Frank Fisher that some of you might know. And it is that the role of the academic is to minimise unproductive debate on the pressing issues of the day. Um, and I think that there is no better example of um, the need for us all to do that as a research community, given what we've, what we've heard. So what would I say? First of all, I'd say that the context for the work that we're all doing, however it's related to climate change and decarbonisation, it's the grandest of the grand challenges. So we're, we're slowly kind of limping towards a more um, cohesive, mission-oriented view of um, what the purpose of research is. I'm quite comfortable with that. Indeed, my discomfort is not that we shouldn't be doing mission-oriented research, but that we're not doing enough of it and fast enough. Um, and I think that part of making that transition is about making sure that we do have these conversations across disciplines and, and that we realise that um, there is an almost an ultimate diversity of important um, debates of which unproductive commentary needs to be minimised. So it doesn't matter how different the, um, the research that you do is from, from others that you might come across, it has an innate value um, and it's really important that you do it and that you do it well. And I think that's been exemplified in the, the diversity of what we've had today. And indeed, um, lots of the other research that SGSS has has been involved in sponsoring as part of this. Um, that brings me on to a kind of um, charge, I suppose, to everybody that you, is the equivalent of what you might hear at your, your graduation. So we're, we're, in this, um, we're in this context of the grandest of grand challenges. At the same time, we are trying to navigate a public debate which is increasingly characterised by scepticism, um, fake news, the prominence of non-expert voices and in general just noise where research based on um, real work real empirical work with real communities doesn't always get the the attention that it might deserve so i would just say to everybody that i think um, being an academic researcher and bringing that rigor and insight to the debate has never been more important and that making sure that we all focus our efforts on maintaining that um, that discipline and the commitment to doing that kind of work is only going to get uh, more and more important as um, the years roll by and the careers of um, the people that we've heard from today develop uh, even further. So, I mean, seriously, well done, everybody, and please stick at it. You cannot underestimate how important the job that you've started is. And uh, that, was, that was lovely words, Ian, and, and I, I posted that quote that you just said. Um, I, I love it. Rahima. Yes, I also thought the talks were really interesting and uh, really did different examples, which was lovely to hear. And I think when I'm asked about interdisciplinarity in the context of today, I'd like to talk about transdisciplinarity and the fact that in sustainability research, such as everybody is doing here, you're not just working on people or on topics, you're working with people. And in sustainability research, we're not just studying climate change out of interest. We are studying it because we have, because of the normative underpinnings that we want to make a difference, that we want to be able to find solutions in some kind of way. But in, in all of your cases, you're working with others to try and explore how that might happen in different ways, whether that's in partnership with a, a funder such as Scott Deck, or whether that's working with local communities in Malawi or whether that's working with planners and planning departments. And I know that transdisciplinarity is very difficult when you're a PhD student because it takes time to develop the relationships and trust that you need to have meaningful kinds of transdisciplinary interactions and that it's very difficult for you to plan a PhD if you want to be co-producing knowledge with others. So I, I think this is maybe just a permission for those doing a PhD to recognize that that is um, almost an unsolvable problem and that it's something that once you have your PhD and, and moving on beyond that sometimes becomes possible to establish much longer term relationships and to be able to do that in more detail. So just a plea for integrity, maintain your integrity, never promise more than you can deliver when you're working with people and try to work with rather than on people. 
great great advice Rahima. Simon yeah I mean what 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 more is there left to say I mean I thought it was actually I felt really encouraged and and although some of the content you know could be a bit disheartening but actually overall I felt actually this is really encouraging really positive what people are doing um and you know I, I personally I think you know why do we even have disciplines in the era of the Anthropocene I think we should actually just move away from this idea of disciplinarity entirely myself but um not quite you know that it, it, it these things sort of get so embedded you know institutions and they become so difficult somehow to move people away so I sort of always struggle with this internally when I'm talking to mathematicians or to physicists or biologists are they wedded to these these disciplines which I suppose we have to respect but it also to me it feels like wow this is really holding us back and um but I mean I yeah I really liked the way that all, all the all the talks are really focused on you know, making making research relevant and useful by which I don't just mean a sort of narrow instrumental idea of useful it's you know really I found it really fascinating how so many different dimensions were being brought into the into the talks and so many different perspectives I thought that was really valuable actually and also that that you know deep respect for people's lived realities which um you know what what you know that that's got to be the core of research, I think, in in this whole area. And I did have have a sort of proposal actually at the end, which was that I'd really like to meet you all, and uh, I want to get back to doing stuff in person and having opportunity to talk um, informally. So I just wondered whether this is a kind of question for Andrew. Really, is there any chance we can do this as a sort of uh, uh, another event of this sort? um in person and have a wider set of speakers and posters and all that sort of thing is this even possible i mean i'd be happy to help to organize something if if this was considered to be valuable by other people put um, you on the spot andrew <laughs> well, no, but, I mean, obviously um i i can't say in turn you know yes or no in terms of um what events have been planned specifically for climate um but i mean definitely next year when we the idea is to run these events and focus on topical um, issues. Um, but no, I, I know very much it's the plan moving forward. But I would take that point. You know, are you talking about the focus on climate? Is that what you're or generally? Well, per personally, I'm, I'm really interested in, in doing it for climate and bringing these people. But also, we know, we have those really interesting posters as well, uh, which, which I'd like to sort of be able to talk to the poster design, okay. you know, people who did those well. And, and I'm sure there's, you know, lots of other people who'd like to get involved. Yeah, I will, I will let, me, let, me, let me work on that one. Okay, great, but definitely in, the, in person. Right, I want to wrap up for five o'clock. So I just want to finish by thanking, I want to thank the presenters. Um, for someone who's a non-expert, I find that the, the, the work was very well presented, very clear. I know there was a bit of support there and I think it was worth it. And I hope people saw that presentation of slides. It was very articulately presented and the passion was very clearly there. So thank you very much. Also, that extends to the posters. Um, I was able to have a little look at that and I encourage anyone who hasn't to do that. Um, there, are, there are five posters there are really, really interesting. Um, the expert panel, thank you so much for all the work in reviewing all the abstracts that were sent as well. It was very competitive and it was really difficult choosing, I know, um, a selection because all, all we would have loved to have heard from everyone there. Thank you for doing that and also sharing your insights and your experiences now. And I, I'm going to go extend myself and say um, you might want to, you know, if people want to get in contact with any questions, anything you've said, you might respond to them. Um, if anyone's got any questions, is that OK? Um, and and finally, um, yeah, just for everyone here who on a late on a on a what day are we now? Wednesday, late on a Wednesday, um, especially on Zoom to do another two hours at this time is hard work. So thank you so much for being here and thank you. And yeah, I hope we get to meet, see each other in um, face to face sometime in the near future. Well, thank you again and goodbye, everyone.